Our series today comes to uh, the third installment and in keeping with much of the tone of Ecclesiastes and in keeping with the last two weeks, I've served you with a very depressing sermon title, Success is Not Satisfying, right? Success is Not Satisfying. Uh, a third ad break. I'm going to squeeze in one more ad break. Next week when I'm not here and when we are in Tande, uh, we're going to have, it's a five-part series, our Ecclesiastes, but there's a bonus episode, right? It's a five-part series with a bonus episode. The bonus episode is next week because our brother Rodney Coe, give it up for Rodney, whoa, whoa. Our brother Rodney uh, will be preaching um, on something to do with Ecclesiastes as well. So I'm not going to spill the beans, uh, partly because I don't have the beans to spill. Uh, okay, I, I, I don't know what he's going to say. <laughs> no, I know, I know a little bit, right? Um, uh, but, but Brother Rodney will be sharing the word next week, you know, and, uh, he'll be, he'll, and it will also be an angle on Ecclesiastes. In many ways, an angle on what I'm going to share today as well, on success, work, and some of these things, right? But today, I want to share with you about Success is not satisfying. Now, if you're new to Ecclesiastes, as I'm sure uh, some of you, I see many new faces, Ecclesiastes is a book of the Bible. And it is a particularly um, observational book of the Bible, okay, where the person doing the teaching in this book is making observations that are really sharp that no one else in the Bible is doing. He's asking questions that no one else is asking. And so, what we're going to see are very, very difficult questions. It's going to unearth and overturn a lot of the things that you and I understand to be normal, day-to-day -day truth. And it's going to question all those things. And it's going to do it quite forcefully. And so, today, I'm going to take you through all the Bible verses where in Ecclesiastes that challenges our ideas of success. It's going to challenge our ideas of success. And so, today's sermon will feel a little bit like um, those webzines. You've got these articles that says, eight reasons why something, something, something. You all, you all know those, right? You, you read them and you don't actually read them. You just scroll and you just look at the header, 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 right? Okay, today's sermon is eight reasons why success is not satisfying. I'm going to plunge right in. Number one, <coughs> success is not satisfying because someone else destroys it for you. You can build something grand. You can, you're laughing, right? Okay, it's, it's okay to laugh. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a reasonable response to seeing some of these things, right? Um, you built something great. You built something big. You built something that should be strong and should last forever. And then when your time is up, you have to hand it over to someone else. And the book of Ecclesiastes asks you this question. Is it satisfying if you hand it over to someone else and that someone else, you don't know if they're going to maintain, you hope they can make it better, but what if that someone else turns out to be foolish and they destroy it for you? Because Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 18 says, I hated all my work that I labored under the sun because I must leave it to the one who comes after me. Right? And why? And who knows whether they'll be wise or a fool, yet he will take all my work that I labored at skillfully under the sun. He has worked hard. He doesn't know if what he has built or what she has built is going to actually last. I have a question for you, church. If what you want is to build an empire or an institution that memorializes you forever, as if it's a grand thing, it will last through the generations and generations that your name will last forever. Church, will it? Will it? Because many people have come and sought to build these things. Uh, when we were in our Acts series, we saw that even King Herod, uh, the Herod the Great, built that Jerusalem temple, right? In order to show off his own splendor and his mega projects, man, right? And his mega project lasted 100 years, about 100 years, AD 70, Jerusalem was sacked, everything was torn to the ground, right? Someone else may well destroy it for you. And the book of Ecclesiastes is asking, if that happens, 
Is success really satisfying to hand it over and not know what's next? Next one. Success is not satisfying because someone else enjoys the fruit of your work. Ah, means you work so hard, but you don't get to enjoy it, right? Why? It says here, God gives some people wealth, possessions, honour, so that they lack nothing their hearts desire, but God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, right? Now, here's the thing. I think most of us who are parents, grandparents, we are very willing to work really hard and deny ourselves enjoyment, deny ourselves the, the, the fruit of our spoils if we can hand it to our children. If our children benefit from it, we can say, I'll sacrifice. I'm prepared to go all the way. I'm prepared to, 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 to don't eat so that my children can eat double, right? Now, I know many of you have lived the life of that kind of self-sacrifice. That's not what he's talking about. Because the teacher in Ecclesiastes is saying, God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, and who? Strangers get to enjoy it. Meaning you work so hard, in the end, you end up not being able to enjoy the fruit of your labour. Other people, people you don't know, come in, you know, and enjoy all your spoils. Now, here's the thing about the book of Ecclesiastes and today's sermon. Today's sermon, like much of Ecclesiastes, like much of the book of Proverbs as well, so we need to grow in our in our Bible reading and Bible interpretation skills. When you read a book like Ecclesiastes, when you read a book like Proverbs, it is not giving you formulas that, that works out exactly like this every single time. Okay? It's not meant to be a formula. It's not meant to be a promise that, Janji, this will happen to you, right? It's not. It's giving you general, if you can say, predictions not in a supernatural kind of prediction, but it's just general uh, 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 forecast, right, of the kind of realities that are in this world. And one of the forecasts is that if you chase after that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you're chasing it, you're chasing it, and by the way, it's a very difficult chase, it's a very difficult pursuit. Why? Because it keeps going ahead of you. Have you, you're, you're familiar with the expression, the goalposts keep moving, right? I hope that when we play football at game on, the goalposts don't keep moving, right? <laughs> but when you're chasing this success, whatever, however you define success, wealth, uh, good name, fame, you know, many followers, I don't know how you define success, but you're chasing it, it keeps moving away. And just as you're about to be able to lay hold to it, it slips out of your grasp and it goes ahead further and you have to run extra hard to keep chasing that dream. The book of Ecclesiastes has an expression of for it. It says, a chasing after the wind. You can't catch it. You can't claim it. You can't hold it. It will never be in your hands. You will keep on pursuing it until the day you die. And one of the reasons why it's very unsatisfying is after all of that bluster, after all of that effort, after all of that running, other people enjoy. You make so much money, but you never gave yourself one day of enjoyment. Now, it's not true. I know you're going on holidays, right? Because attendance at church goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down. So I know you're going on holidays. And that's fine, by the way. Please do enjoy the fruit of your spoils. But what is it trying to say? Is it saying that, oh, because I do go on holiday, sometimes this doesn't apply to me? No. What it's really saying is that, do you have a lifestyle? And an entire life? Are you building an entire life that is built upon a lot of work? And then other people enjoy it and you don't. I'm going to move on. Success... It's questionable, right? Not satisfying because number three, you did it all out of envy anyway. Now, many, many, many you guys are like, no lah, where God? I'm not the envious kind one, pastor. Where God? I'm very, I'm very at peace. I, I praise God when other people succeed. You know, that's not me. You know, I say praise God for you. Amen? All right? Um, uh, and yeah, it's true. Most of us will probably not own up to envy. 
Okay? And in English, we have all these expressions uh, um, to, 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 that gives us a clue that this is part of our life and it's part of our world. We have expressions like the grass is always greener on the other side, right? And so uh, uh, um, we have this idea that we do look across and say, hey, quite nice or so, huh? Actually, what's happening there? Okay, but I know, so at Below Church, maybe you all say that, no la, pastor, I'm not the envious sort. Okay, so since you're not the envious sort, I'm just going to ask you a question, right? Um, and you tell me, right? At your level right now, what is one thing you feel you are lagging behind on owning? Think about it for a moment, right? At your level right now, okay, whatever it may be, what is one thing you feel you are lagging behind? On owning. You should have owned this by now. Think about it. I just want you to rest on it. Three, two, you don't have to shout out your answer, okay? Please, yeah, yeah. I hear someone going like Bentley Continental. At my level right now, I, 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 I'm overdue one, right? Three, two, one, stop. If this expression did not ring any kind of, of uh, if it did not ups set your equilibrium, if it did not, it was not jarring for you, but it sounds perfectly normal, how many of you, you did start answering that question, right? right? And just nod your head, right? If you just started answering that question and this expression at your level did not jar you, it means you're susceptible to envy because you think in terms of your levels. It means you think in terms of your level and you're comparing yourself. You implicitly do compare yourself to you when you were at your previous level. And I can tell you what, if you're really honest with yourself, you're not just comparing yourself to you at your previous level, you're also comparing yourself to other people who were at your previous level. And you're also comparing yourself to other people who are at your current level. And you're also comparing yourself to people who are one rung above you. And then you start to social climb. You know what social climbing is? Social climbing is when you look at the people around you and you say, I'm not satisfied with where I am. I see this group. I see these people. I want to emulate them. I'm going to start mixing in different crowd. I'm going to start owning the things they own. I'm going to start, start going to the places they go or eating in the places they eat. Now, we don't do this consciously. To be fair, None of us go like, wow, I'm starting to indulge my envy of this people. We don't do that consciously. But the very notion that we do think in terms of my social rank, we walk into a room, we go into a party, we meet people, we automatically start to, to find our social positioning in a place, right? And we, and we estimate like, okay, I think I'm lebih kurang this kind of people. I think I can fit in here, you know? Now, the very notion, I'm not saying you are envious. I'm saying that the very notion that these things occur to you or, uh, or, or occur in you means that you are susceptible. You are at risk. It can come upon you. This feeling that you're looking sideways and saying, actually, you know what? By now, I should have something more. And that is really what Ecclesiastes is saying when it says that your pursuit for success came from envious roots. What it's saying, it's not saying that, oh, you're very lousy and envious. It's not. What it's really saying is that a lot of the times when we pursue success, it is because we are looking around. And because we are looking around, these things become goals. These things become motivations for us to keep on pursuing success. And I can tell you this, it can sound like good motivation. It can sound like a good source for giving you drive and for giving you energy. It might even drive you to become very successful. But is it a good source? Is it a good fuel? Is it healthy for you? It may not be healthy for you. In fact, I'll challenge you to say it is not. In fact, it can be very dangerous for you if you are being propelled forward constantly by looking sideways and above. But we may not be able to escape this. And I don't think we can. It would be naive for a pastor to come out and say that don't look sideways, don't compare yourself to other people, right? Because it's social nature. 
we are social beings, we are created for relationship, we are created in community, and it's a normal part of whether it is natural, whether it is just part of being in broken, sinful world, that we do look around. And that's the reality. But Ecclesiastes, the teacher, is reminding us and nudging us. It's like the friend who's just constantly reminding us, hey, be careful of this one. Just be careful of this one. I know it happens to all of us. Just be careful. And that's what I'm saying to you today. The fourth one, right? Why success is elusive. Success is mysterious. Success may not be as satisfying as it advertises. Is this. You work for yourself, but actually you were impossible to please. And I'm thinking, no, 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 I work for my boss and my boss is impossible to please. That's a different story. And that might be, quite a, that might be a reason why success can be quite unsatisfying too, right? But this one says in verse, chapter 4, verse 8, there is a person without a companion, without even a son or brother, and though there is no end to all his struggles, meaning he's alone, his struggle is working really hard. His eyes are still not content with riches. He's got everything, but his eyes are not content. His taste buds are never satisfied. Keep eating, keep eating, never satisfied. Right? Keep seeing, keep seeing. But you cannot stop. Why? Because these things do not truly fill up. Who am I struggling for? He asks. Don't have son? Ma? Don't have companion? Ma? Don't have brother? Ma? There's nobody for this particular character anyway to hand over his wealth to, to hand over or to share his, his spoils with. Yes. Who am I struggling for and depriving myself of good things? And yet, he keeps pursuing. Now, maybe you are not such a chronic version of this, but do you feel this sometimes? that when you, your eyes are on something nice and there's no end to looking at nice things? Uh, maybe you're looking at me like, never experienced it, Pastor. So I'm going to ask you, <laughs> have you ever been on Shopee and you just scroll and scroll and then you, you, you put things to your cart? And then after you've put things, actually your, your card has all the things you need and more. And you've just checked out on a few things as well. And you're still scrolling and look and look and look and look. And then you go and look at the deals. Then you go and look at, oh, this same shop. Uh, let's see what else they have so that cheaper don't have to pay a, a, a lot of, of, of shipping. Then you go look at things that you don't need, but because you want to save shipping, you might want to, you know, just in case, in case got something. And your eyes are never satisfied. Your eyes are not content with how much riches it can take in. And for those of you who use Pinterest, that's you as well. <laughs> yeah, 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 all you Pinterest kaki, I know, right? So in that sense, in that sense, the teacher in the book of Exodus is also suggesting to you, is it truly satisfying if you can take, 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 but you never feel full? You eat, 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 but it never really hits the spot. You want to know why? It's the wrong thing. You're fitting, you're trying to fit a square pack into a round hole. And it will never fit, it will never meet, it will never match. The only one who will match, I'll tell you later. But number five is this. Someone young, success is very frustrating because someone younger will always come and upstage you. How many of you all know this to be true already? Right? How many of you feel that I'm that someone younger right now? I'm coming to my workplace. I'm going to upstage the person before me. I'm going to come and, and take over, you know, uh, uh, out of, with the old, in with the new. I'm the, I'm the happening one now. How many of you feel that way? Nobody here, right? Nobody would admit to it anyway. How many of you have seen, you have experienced being upstaged by someone younger? And you're unupstageable. <laughs> you know, when I was a teenager, I was really into rock music. Specifically, I was into the Brit pop movement, right? And uh, and 
Brit Awards 1996 was the craziest uh, was the craziest uh, award ceremony I've ever known and, and, and in the 90s all the rock stars genuinely behaved badly okay they, they, and their bad behaviour was not scripted like you know Miley Cyrus talking or all kind of thing it's scripted and it's pre-planned and it's rehearsed to death one okay in the 90s the bad behaviour of rock and roll stars was off the cuff totally impulsive and, and, and quite fun to watch if you are just entertaining in, in it for the entertainment. And so at Brit Awards 1996, this, okay, this thing happened. Oasis, how many of you know Oasis, the band Oasis? Yeah, yeah. Oasis had won the award um, for best music video, right? For Wonderwall. They won the award, right? And, uh, and you know Oasis boys, they're like really rough, they're like really foul mouth, and they're like really gangster, bad boys, lah, okay? Working class bad boys. That was their image, right? Um, they came on stage, okay? And the guy who presented the awards to them, the award to them, was none other than Michael Hutchins of In Excess. Now, In Excess was a band from the 80s. Okay, their biggest hit was in 1987. So it's nine years apart. Okay, Michael Hutchins by now was a nobody. In fact, he had fallen in the in the in the social ranking of rock and roll stars. Right, Michael Hutchins by this point was a has been. And when the Oasis boys went up to receive their awards, Noel Gallagher very rudely, very cheekily said. Has beens shouldn't present awards to gonna bees. And then they took that and then they walked off the stage. I show you Michael Hutchins at his prime, right? So 80s handsome, right? Okay? And that's Michael Hutchins in 1996. And these are the new boys, right? Who are now taking rock and roll by storm. Now, I like this story. Because I lived through it and I remember reading all the smash hits and the tabloids and all that and having a lot of watching Brit Awards 96 myself, right? Now, for many years, whenever I think about this idea of younger people coming up to supplant and upstage the older generation, I always think of what Noel Gallagher said, right? has shouldn't present awards to gonna be. And you know what I think about it? So arrogant, right? I think about it because I'm aware that Noel Gallagher is getting older and less relevant each year. And today, he is a lot less relevant to rock and roll music, to pop music, to teenagers, to the people with money to buy and, 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 and move music than he was in 1996. In fact, today, you might even say of him, that he is now the has-been. And so when I think about the relationship between young people upstaging older people, I think of this. And Michael Hutchins is just one of a long line of former rock stars who have had to step into the shadows and see younger, more cool, more current people step into the centre stage. And then the sad part is, the sad part for all, arrogant loudmouths like him is that one day their turn will have to come where they also have to step out into the shadows and the next fella will come the question is how do you do that stepping in how do you do that stepping out and if this is bound to happen the, the teacher in Ecclesiastes is asking is it worth fighting so hard for when you're constantly being upstaged by the next person I'm going to read this part for you, right? Because it's very interesting, but actually there's many layers to this. Better a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king. So in this case, this is Michael Hutchins, okay? Uh, and, 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 and that is supposedly, right, uh, the, the upstaging younger guy, right? Um, who no longer knows how to heed a warning. The youth may have come from prison to the kingship, or he may have been born in poverty within his kingdom. But I saw that all who lived and walked under the sun followed the youth, meaning the blood left the old man and started going to the young man the king's successor. There was no end to all the people who were before them. But those who came later, meaning the 
next batch were not pleased with the successor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. In other words, nobody listens to Oasis as the current happening, only nostalgic 90s kids like me, and you know, maybe Andros, uh, still, still pick up the guitar and play Wonderwall, right? Um, because that stuff is not relevant anymore. One generation comes, one generation keeps going, and it's a displacing thing. Now, it doesn't mean that we should constantly treat the next generation with a sense of envy and contempt that they are going to come out and supplant us. It's not. That's, that's not the idea behind this. The idea behind this is that if what you want out of your success is to cling on to it and be known for all posterity, then guess what? You're fighting a losing battle. That's what Koheleth is trying to teach. If you are trying to make sure... So this, number five, is quite a lot like number one because someone else is going to go after you, right? If you're trying to make sure that your name, your legacy, your, your, your institutional power, your whatever hall of fame of... Maybe not rock and roll for most of us, but some kind of hall of fame, right? We want to be known. If that's what we are clinging on to, it is a losing battle. You will be forgotten. So if you want to pursue success, say it differently, right? If you want to pursue success, make sure you're not pursuing success in order to be holding on to that, to be held on forever. You will be disappointed. That's the point. The next one is, I think, my favorite and in this entire list of eight items. The next reason why success is not satisfying is that scaling adds more useless stuff to the world and more problems to your sleep. Let me read to you the text, right? Like, where do you get this from? In Ecclesiastes, I get it from here. 5 verse 11. As goods increase, so do those who consume them, right? Okay, so you produce a lot, more people will, will consume. The world did not need an iPhone, until Apple created the iPhone. And then suddenly we realized that, no, we need the iPhone. And the same can be said of the, actually it began with the iPod, right? Y how many of y'all had the iPod? You could like scroll around the thing, y'all had that, right? Okay, nobody knew that we would need an iPod, right? At that time, this man was good enough until they created the iPod and you can like stuff MP3s into it, right? And then suddenly we needed it. And we, past a certain point, we couldn't live without our, we can't live without our, our mobile phones anymore, right? Because we have augmented our behaviours to be dependent on these things. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners? Except to feast your eyes on them, remember? I, just, I talked about feasting your eyes, okay? Never satisfied. The sleep of a labourer is sweet whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. In other words, the book of Ecclesiastes is challenging our ideas of success because I can tell you this, if you run a business, your goal is to grow. And if you run a business that is growing, maybe rapidly, your goal is to scale. I can tell you this Almost every bus any businessman you talk to Businesswoman you talk to Entrepreneur you talk to Will tell you Grow And prepare to scale And when, Because when you can grow And when you can scale You might even get listed And you can get your nice exit Right? Or maybe you don't want to exit Maybe that's what you want to do Is to keep scaling And keep growing Because this is your, this is your legacy Right? It doesn't matter which way you want to go The point that is being said here is that you want to scale, you really want to scale? Well, if you keep scaling, firstly, you may well be just adding more useless stuff into the world as you scale, okay? Because as, as, as we can tell, a lot of the stuff we add into this world is not really needed. I mean, we need it as, a, as kind of like modern day artifacts. We need them for living in the modern world, but you don't really need it for your soul. You don't really need it to, it's not what you need the most. And then, we're still, you get more problems. Now, um, I did not read the following book that I'm going to quote from, but there is a section from this book. I heard of it uh, some time ago, um, uh, and 
I found the quotation again. It is the book called Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. How many of you are familiar with this book? You see in the bookstores, in the, in the latest section or whatever. Now, I'm going to read this because he talks about the agricultural revolution. In fact, I'm just going to read it to you straight uh, from here, okay? Rather than heralding a new era of easy living, he's talking about Civilization, okay? A long, long time ago when we were hunters and gatherers, okay? And then suddenly we decided that actually we can farm a plot of land. And actually, let's cultivate wheat. And as you cultivate wheat, now you're anchored to the land and you got to work on the land. And, but now you can scale, right? Because the same crop and you can just add more and add more and add more. So Harari says this, rather than heralding a new era of easy living, the agricultural revolution left farmers with lives generally more difficult and less satisfying than those of foragers. Now, hunters and gatherers spent their time in more stimulating and varied ways and were less in danger of starvation and disease. The agricultural revolution certainly enlarged the sum total of food at the disposal of humankind. Because when you start farming, and you can, do not, you can do the same thing for multiple plots of land, by the way, I discovered that the amount of wheat, land that has wheat planted on it in the world, is eight times the size of Great Britain. That's a lot of agriculture. Now, the agricultural revolution enlarged the total sum of food at the disposal of humankind, but the extra food did not translate into a better diet or more leisure. Scaling does not necessarily improve the quality of life, but rather it translated into population explosions and pampered elites. The ones who sit at the top of the food chain of the agricultural revolution get pampered. Everybody else, actually, their quality of life drops. Now, see how he ends this. The average farmer worked harder than the average forager and got a worse diet in return. This is the essence of the agricultural revolution, the ability to keep more people alive but under worse conditions. Now, I look out at y'all. I know many of you have gone through different kinds of workplaces. So I'm going to turn this into a workplace thing, okay, for a moment. Humor me. If you've worked in, uh, how many of you have worked in a small business before? Right? You've worked in a small business before, okay? How many of you have also have worked in a huge, like a multinational, a really huge place where, where your office has multiple floors, maybe at over 100 staff or maybe over 200 staff. You've done that before? You've gone through that experience? Yeah, okay. okay. You all will know that when you were small or when you were working in a smaller place, you had a better bond with your reporting bosses in all likelihood. Like, okay, It's not 100%, but this is going to be likely for most of the time. You had a better bond with your report, the person you reported to. In all likelihood, you may have had a better, even trust relationship with your colleagues. Sideways, okay? Um, you had better and tighter lunches, okay? Your work hours may have been, now you, I don't doubt that you worked really hard as well, right? But somehow the whole thing felt just slightly more relational and slightly more personal. And then when you ended up in some huge corporate institution, you clocked in. You clocked out, you clocked in, you clocked out. You, could, you were exposed to a lot of things. You were exposed to big business. You were exposed to, 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 to scale in doing business that you would never have been able to touch if you stayed in an SME, right? But because you encountered all of these things, the general culture was one of uniformity and everyone was expected to come in and clock in and clock out. And there were a lot more policies to manage lots of people. So there were more policies about how you use the pantry. There were more policies about how you're supposed to leave the toilet. You had more policies about work hours and all those kind of things. And guess what? I just described to you what Harari is describing here about the agricultural revolution, right? Because you realize that when you scale, the atmosphere immediately changes. When you scale, you enjoy certain things. You can do big things. So let's be, let's be fair. You can do big things that when you were small, you could not do. But when you scale, 
the atmosphere of intimacy and fellowship and community and all these things also start to over, across the board lower. Now I'm going to hit the rubber on the road. I have people coming to me all the time and saying, Pastor Fox, Sungai Buloh Church is going to double, it's going to triple, it's going to grow five times. You're going to need a new big building. You're going to need this and that. Now, now, now first, I want to say thank you for the trust because I would not say those things about uh, anything that I start, but this is not something that just I start, other people in it, and also God's hand is upon it. So I will not despise that kind of word, okay? So I just want to put it out there. But there seems to be, in some circles, the sense church must keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and have no end to how big church can possibly grow. So that one day we can take up five floors, or six floors, ten floors, build an auditorium that can fit uh, 10,000, you know? And that will be the best vision of church. Why? Because so many people coming to Jesus. But what if 10,000 can be 100 churches of 100? Can 10,000 not be 100 churches of 100 instead of one church of 10,000? And I'm going to ask you, if y'all... Now, forget Harari and forget what I've just said. Y'all have experience working in small places and big places. So you have to decide whether 10,000 in one church or 100 churches of 100 like this. Imagine if there were 100 Sungai Buloh churches, right? Which is the vision you have for how Christians are to gather. Because if you are attracted to the pictures and the videos and the stories and the sweeping mass of people and you think that this is not good enough just for a rare occasion but this should be every Sunday I'm going to ask you to get that, take that and see if it works when you translate it into the things you yourself have experienced when you were involved in small things and big things, when you had a small family and, or, or when you had to go on holidays with lots of relatives, for example, you know, um, or when you, Chinese New Year, you know, with like 50 different relatives in one house, right? The atmosphere of that, you know, compared to, you know, um, your reunion dinner, six of you in your house, you know, uh, which one do you see as the vision for how God is gathering his people. Now, I say this with quite a bit of trepidation because it's not straightforward to cap growth. Nobody wants to cap growth. Okay? And to some extent, it would be ungodly to unnecessarily cap growth. Right? That, so that's not, the, that's not the goal either. Or rather, that's not the solution either. But I'm saying this to you all as kind of like just getting the conversation going between pastor and congregation. Let's not have our eyes terpikat with the sea of people for us as an every Sunday thing. Now, big events, why not? Right? Once off, why not? But I need every single one of you, as our community, to ask yourself what vision do you have, does God have for the gathering of His people on a normal, everyday basis? Sunday. And what do you want for us? And as we double, if God wills it, what do you want for the, ex the next batch of hundred? What do you want for them? What's good for them? What's good for their discipleship? What's good for their after church atmosphere? Can we do King's Table? Can they do King's Table? If all of us all cannot do King's Table, is it better for all of us? If I can't disciple 100, what makes me think I can disciple 10,000? And guess what? If I, the day I have to disciple 10,000, you know what I'm going to have to do? I won't discipling. I, I'll be discipling the people who'll be discipling the people who'll be discipling the people who'll be discipling the people who are going to, I'm not going to move on, who'll be discipling the 10,000. And then you're going to say, Pastor is out of reach. He is so far from the rest of us, right? Is that how God sees shepherds? 
I'm going to leave those questions with you because I do want to move on. And this is just the start of an ongoing conversation between me and all of you because we are going to grow this church together. And day by day, there will be new people coming in and one day, there will be more seats taken. And one day, we may, God willing, outgrow this place. And we will need to have the right eyes to see. Stop there. Number seven. Everything can be lost. Just like that. Success is not satisfying because there are factors out there in this world that can cause you to lose everything just like that, right? There is a sickening tragedy, says the teacher, right? I have seen under the sun wealth kept by its owner to its own harm. Why? That wealth was lost in one bad venture. So that when he fathered his son, he was empty-handed, nothing to give. Because why? One mistake, one bad call, right? Sometimes it's not even your fault. Sometimes this happens. You all remember the 2008 stock market crash, right? Some of you are old enough to remember the Black Monday, 1987. I think that still holds the record 508 points that the Dow crashed. And overnight, 97, the Asian financial crisis as well. And I think I should have, I should have pulled that up because that one affected us in a much more, much more local kind of way, right? And I heard stories. My father was telling me um, uh, he knew of Remisius who just disappeared. And, and later we realized that, I mean, we heard stories that family, friends had jumped off bridges, you know. They had debts that, that, that just tore, tore them apart. They just could not live uh, live it down that they had lost so much and everything was wasted and they uh, and I know of of people family friends my one of my primary school friends fathers right uh, uh, took his life in the 97 financial crisis and I'm telling you it's not just my stories to share all of us know of people who are badly hit some of us were badly hit some of us have survived until today in a different state and in a different form because of some of these things Success, at least the way the world defines it, where it's glittering and glamorous and full of money and wealth and fame and power, it's very transient. It can just go just like that. And as I said, it may not even be your fault. And that's why the teacher is... Now, he's not asking you don't pursue and don't do well in life. He's not. In case you suddenly want you like, wow, what does this pastor want from us? Huh? He wants us to be lousy at work, is it? No! He wants us to be failure, is it? No. No, I want every single one of you to succeed. Yes, I do. I genuinely do. And I also want all of you guys to make more than just ends meet. I do. What I don't want you to do is to put all your hopes in that to bring you the satisfaction. Because these things come into your hands and the call for us is to steward it well. Because they did not, you did not create them. They came into your hands. By God's grace, they fell onto your lap. You stumbled upon a good venture. You bought stock in one particular uh, 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 counter. It, you didn't make the counter uh, uh, climb. Other people worked hard. And then the counter climbed. You came into money. It didn't come from you. And it should not stay on you. God puts it in your hands so that you can do something with it. Who calls the shots? He calls the shots. Why? He gave it to you. And because He gives it to you, it's in your hands to do what He wants with it. That's called stewardship. That's the principle of stewardship. And in the kingdom of God, you don't own and hoard. You own and ask the one who gave it to you, what did you want to, this for? You give it to me, for a reason. Why did you give it to me? And God's going to say, I give it to you because I know you can release it. And I want certain people to have it. And then He says, now, release it. And that will be the test of your character. And that will be the test of your walk with God. In the New Testament, Jesus tells this story. He told the story of a man, a rich man 
whose land was very productive and he thought to himself, what should I do eh, since I've had a bumper harvest, right? I don't have anywhere to store my crops. I know. I'm going to tear down my barns, build bigger ones, and store, 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 store. A crew, a crew, a crew, a crew, right? Now, if you are a good Bible student, this should remind you of an Old Testament story. It should be a compare and contrast with Joseph in Egypt. Built, 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 bumper harvest, seven fat cows, store, store, store. But why did God ask Joseph to store? So that when the day comes and famine hits, poor people are going to come to your doorstep and out of your mercy, which I'm going to put into your heart, you're going to sell, sell, sell and supply and supply and supply because God's way is never for you to hoard, never for you to accrue, never for you to uh, uh, um, amass. Is that a better word? To amass and then hold. And then you can look at your portfolio and say, I'm a somebody because I've amassed so much. That's not God's currency for success. And so what happens to this gentleman? You say, I have so many goods stored up for so many years. Now I can go young kaki, ka until I die. God said to him, you fool. What a fool. Because this very night, I'm going to demand your life from you. So you can have all of these things, but it just goes just like that. It goes just like that. So how do you define success, my friends? The last of the eight. You can't control weather. You can't control war. Right? No one has authority over the wind to restrain it. There's no authority over the day of death. No one is discharged during battle. Right? What it's really saying is that there are factors that determine earthly success, social climbing, wealth gaining. There are factors that determine the rise and fall of not just empires, but businesses that are just mysterious to us all. Havel, Havelim, Hakol, Havel. It's smoke. You can't even predict. You can't even forecast with great accuracy. You think you can, and there are gurus who can, but I can tell you, some of these headlines caught everyone by surprise. And so, if I told you that all the currency that you hold today, today, has actually devalued to kosong, okay? Okay? Whatever portfolio you have, Whatever currency you hold, whatever um, uh, uh, assets you possess today, what if I told you that all of those things has actually, last night, devalued to essentially zero? The paper value, okay, uh, um, is absolutely wiped out. Okay, let's just say, if I told you that. But, people don't know it yet. And it will become public in three days' time. Okay? And so for now, actually no, the paper value is still high. But the intrinsic value has totally left. Okay? And so in three days' time, the paper value will reflect its intrinsic value now. Okay? If I told you that, so today you can still go to the money changer or you can still go to the trading places and quickly cash out on what you have and exchange it for a currency or for a commodity that can hold value. If I told you that, what would you do? Now, I'm not asking you what commodity you will buy. I'm asking you what would you do with this knowledge? You go. How many of you will... Oh yeah, now some of you might say, tomorrow lah. Tomorrow lah, queue very long or maybe queue not long, doesn't matter. Today very busy, I'll go tomorrow. Tomorrow you'll be like, sure not. You know? But actually, apparently, in two days' time, all this value is going to reflect. And then when it actually does reflect, I have nothing. Today, I can still take all of it and exchange it for something of equivalent or higher value. Would you go? I think you would go. 
Any one of us would go. Now, here's the thing. A lot of the things we fight so hard to obtain, the intrinsic value of those things are very fleeting. They are very transient. They last, four score and 20 is the old-fashioned way of saying it, right? They last your lifetime. And I don't know if you think your lifetime, let's say 80, 90 years, if you're very blessed, you get to triple digits, if that's a long time. Maybe you think it's a long time. Brother, sister, it's a blink of an eye. Because what you are comparing against is not 80, 90 years of the fellow next door. You're comparing against eternity. And eternity is not just a hundred million billion years, which in itself is already a lot bigger, okay? And in, which in itself already dwarfs your hundred years on earth, okay? That eternity is no number to contain. And if I told you a hundred million billion to the, to the power of another billion compared to eternity, I will say that number is small minuscule compared to eternity because eternity is its own thing. And so, the things we fight so hard, work so hard to cling on to, and I'm not just talking about money, it can be your power, it can be your position, it could be your rank, it could be your, your, your well-knownness, or your followers on social media. These things are super transient. And God is saying to us today, exchange it for the better currency. So what is God's currency? What is His notion of success? Today is not a fundraising. Okay? I'm not here to fundraise. So I'm not going to show you the next slide. The next slide is, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, store up treasures in heaven. And where is the treasure in heaven? The treasure box is there by the wall, you know. <laughs> Guys, today is not a fundraiser, okay? Today is not a fundraiser. I'm telling you to exchange it, your heart, your effort, your work, your dreams, your hopes, exchange it for what? God considers to be the most fundamental markers and metrics of a successful person. You want to know what they are? They don't even have commodities in them. It says this, love God, love your neighbour as yourself. Now, you might be like, I can do both. I can do both, pastor. I can make lots of wealth and love lots of things and I can still love my neighbour. You know, you, you know what's the real test? When you can sell your possessions and give it to your neighbor, right? Don't give it to the church. Don't bother giving it to the church, right? Because this is not a fundraiser. You can sell your possessions and give it straight to your neighbor. You know whether you love your things or your neighbor more. Right? No, you did say not right, not right. There's something wrong with your equation. Recalculate, right? No, right. Bang on right. It's, it, it, you just don't want to hear it, maybe, right? On a personal level, the biggest, most important metric for success. Love God, love your neighbor as you love yourselves. That's it. There is no higher metric than this. Jesus himself said, all the commandments of the Old Testament, everything hangs on this. On a personal level, your personal vision casting, your personal goal setting. If this is not driving your growth, Something else is driving your growth. And then I will tell you, you cannot love two masters. Either you will love the one and hate the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. That's where the rubber hits the road. And so I am not telling you, don't go and make lots of money. I'm telling you, what drives you to make lots of money? And at a church, at a ministry level, what is the highest metric? There are lots of metrics. And I describe to you churches to the tune of 10,000, you know, and I leave that to you to think where that sits on the metric of a successful gathering of God's people. But I can tell you the most important metric for the gathering of God's people, go make disciples, right? Go to the ends of the earth make disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey God. 
and then he'll be with you until the end of the age and that will be the call on me i can tell you when i show up before god in heaven he's not going to ask me about did i manage to fill 10000 he may chat with me about that but that's not the thing that he's going to be like fergus reckoning day did you hit whatever right he's not going to ask me about a lot of other things He's going to ask me, did you make disciples? And out of the fear of the Lord, I'm going to have to make disciples. Because I don't want to walk outside of God's command over His shepherd, of His flock. You're His flock. And I'm your pastor appointed by Him to make disciples out of all of you. And in the same way, all of us have been invited and ushered into a call to go and be fishers of men make disciples and so my church what is your idea of success on the surface it can look like the same thing it can look exactly as saying you still go out there you still do well at your job you still make money you you uh, you grow you become good at growing things it can look the same thing but my church if you're drinking from the wrong kind of fuel you will end up in a different kind of place. I sense in my spirit that there's some of you, you needed God to stop you in your tracks today. And you, I don't know what journey you've been on, but God has been wanting to stop you in your tracks today. And if that is you, and I pray that there is someone here who's really encountered God through His Word today, I'm praying for you right now. Lord Jesus, if there is anyone here who needed to be stopped so that they can reconsider and recalibrate and redirect, Lord Jesus, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will speak and you will work and you will bring about that redemption and you will bring about that restoration. You will pull us out from the jaws of the lion and of the bear and you will cause us to grow strong, pointed towards Christ alone, our cornerstone. And so, church, if that is for you, I'm praying with you. We're all praying with you. Now, for the rest of us, if this was just another Sunday where the Word just challenges us, I'm praying for you as well. Let's all pray together. Lord, it is a good thing for the Word to challenge us. It is a good thing for the Word to come and reshape us deep in our hearts. It is a very good thing for your own hand to reach deep into our, the place of our values, reach deep into the place of our thrones and dethrone dethrone the things of this world dethrone the ambitions of this world dethrone all the whatever else that we live for that is so transient so temporary dethrone all of those things and put on the throne of our hearts king jesus who bids us forward to live forever and to live for forever May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn His face to shine upon you and be gracious with you. May the Lord turn and lift up His countenance toward you and give you shalom. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.